Okay, here we go. So the class you are in is Garden Pests and Diseases. Um, Sheree Schaefer, horticulture agent at CSU Extension in Pueblo County, for those of you who just joined us. So some major topics that I'm going to be talking about today, I want to start off by talking about integrated pest management. This is um, a theory or a way of uh, handling things in your garden that encompasses a lot of different kinds of techniques. So we're not just going straight for the spray or the chemical. Um, we're kind of seeing maybe what's the cause of, of why I'm seeing this this pest or disease in my garden and what are some other steps I can take before I get to chemical usage. And then we're going to go into some specific pests and these are pretty specifically things I've been seeing in Pueblo, in Colorado, things that we've been getting calls on, but some of them are definitely uh, universal. And then we're going to go into the diseases after that. So let's talk a little bit about integrated pest management. This is a multi-pronged approach. So we have a lot of different kinds of techniques that we can try to use to handle a problem. The, there's a variety of management strategies and those would include cultural strategies. So meaning um, maybe you have poor airflow, which is a huge thing, especially for a lot of the diseases. So maybe a little bit of pruning or better spacing in your garden would help. That would be cultural that you could do. Mechanical, uh, the thing that comes to mind with mechanical would be pulling a weed rather than spraying it or something like that. Um, biological, a lot of uh, different weeds and, and different pests have a lot of natural enemies. So taking advantage of the natural enemies of a certain organism would be a biological control. And then of course we have chemical methods as well, which sometimes, you know, you might have to resort to those. And as long as you are always reading the label and always using products only on plants that they're labeled for, only for the pest or disease that you have, and you follow all the different safety precautions, the product should be pretty safe to use. Um, but you always, always, always should read the label front to back of any product that you're ever going to use. Now these management strategies, this is kind of the order that you would want to um, look into handling a pest or disease in your garden. So is there something cultural I could do, mechanical, are there any biological kinds of solutions? And then getting the chemical methods is kind of the last uh, choice for handling whatever it is that you've got going on. So the objective of integrated pest management is obviously minimize pest, pest damage or disease damage and also minimize any health and environmental hazards that could come up while still maintaining, you know, if you're a producer, an agricultural producer, you want to maintain profit profitability, obviously, but uh, you also want to, um, you know, a good aesthetics, good safety for your um, vegetables or things that you're growing like for eat. So here are just a few examples of some of these techniques and we'll talk more about all of these once we get into the topics here. But you know, plant selection is a strategy. Sometimes there's a certain pest or disease that goes after a certain species of plant, but there are varieties of that plant that are resistant. So you might want to try to find those resistant varieties and then you don't have to deal with the problem in the first place. Same thing goes with um, maybe, for example, roses. There's certain rootstock that is more susceptible. So you might just be looking for a rootstock that isn't susceptible to whichever problem you're anticipating. Soil management is huge. A lot of problems start in the soil. So it's always good to get a soil test. Um, if you have extension in your state, which if you're in Colorado, you absolutely do, you can contact your county extension office to talk about getting a soil test kit. Uh, it's always good to know what's going on in the soil. Um, it's good to amend it so that it's well draining but can hold enough moisture for the plants. So having good soil is a good first step. And along with that, so is water management. A lot of these different, especially the diseases, are spread when we have a lot of water splashing on the leaves. So even just switching to like a drip irrigation or something like that can be helpful. So how you're watering, how often you're watering, when you're watering, these are all things that could be a technique in handling whatever issue it is that you're seeing. Cultural care, like we talked about spacing, pruning, 
um, just kind of how you are growing things and how you're caring for them can oftentimes help with problems. Now, weather influence isn't, I mean, obviously there's nothing we can do about the weather, right? But um, there are, we can anticipate things. If we think that maybe we're gonna get some hail or something like that, we can plan to have hail cloth on hand. If we see it's going to be really, really hot for the next week, maybe we can get some shade cloth. So just kind of anticipating some of those weather things and seeing if there's anything you can do about them. Mechanical methods, you know, um, hand picking beetles or caterpillars off your plants, that's a mechanical pest control method. Some people would never ever probably do that, but if you uh, are okay with actually touching the insects, it's usually pretty helpful. We'll talk about a few specific insects where that is particularly helpful. Natural enemies, another one I mentioned that some of these pests uh, have natural enemies that already will help you take care of them. And sometimes when we end up spraying a pesticide, we kill all those natural enemies. So they might have helped us in the, in the beginning and they were getting ready to you know, increase their numbers and take out this pest, but we killed them by spraying a pesticide. So um, for some of these in particular that are real weak and have a lot of natural enemies, it's sometimes good just to kind of wait it out a little bit. They will find that there's food here and those natural enemies a lot of times will help you to take care of the problem. And then of course there's pesticides. Now you have to consider a lot of things with pesticides. You know, are you eating this plant? Do you wanna be spraying something on it? Is it safe to spray on edibles? Uh, is this sprayed in a place where children or, or animals might get into it? Um, and then, you know, you really just need to make sure you're getting the correct chemicals for the plant and for the problem you're having. And I'll stress it one more time, always, always, always read the label. If you ever are having problems, interpreting the label or you're unsure what something means, that's another thing you can call the extension office for. We can pull up the label online and kind of go through it with you and make sure you're being safe. So here's kind of a list of questions that you should ask yourself when you are trying to implement integrated pest management into your garden. Step one, what is this plant? That's obviously the first thing because like I said, you need to make sure that you are diagnosing the problem right, and that you know what's going on, and finding out the plant is usually step one to that. Because there's certain insects or that might only attack certain kinds of plants, so we really need to start with figuring out what's the plant. Now, second step, once we know the plant, is trying to pinpoint what is the disease or pest that we're having problems with. Sometimes if we're just seeing the damage, that can be a little bit hard. Um, sometimes not, some of the damage is very, uh, unique and we can figure it out, but um, it's helpful if we see the pest and then with the disease, obviously we're only seeing symptoms. But identifying what exactly is going on is definitely important to how you're going to control it. So what kind of damage does it cause? Is uh, there are certain um, pests that will make the leaves of an ornamental not look so good, but the flowers are unaffected. So, you know, is it only going to harm the leaves? Could this spread to the flowers? Could this kill the plant? What is the potential damage of this pest or disease that I'm seeing? And then that leads us into our management efforts warranted. Like I said, if it's only affecting the leaves and you're growing the plant for the flowers, do, how much do you really care to, to even go into management? If it's a plant that maybe you wouldn't even mind losing, do you even care to treat the plant if, there's, if it's not going to be spread other plants. And then if you decide that management is necessary, then what cut, What are my options? Um, you know, what cultural things can I do? Are there biological options? What are the different chemical options, whether they be organic or, or traditional? And then timing. A lot of times it's totally pointless to use a certain product on a certain pest at certain times of the year because they're already past the life stage that it works on. So that would be something to read on the label or again to contact your local extension office and get some help with. All right, so I'm gonna move right into garden pests now. We're gonna start with the bugs and then go into the diseases. So um, the first insect that I think everybody around the country, maybe even around the world, would probably have to deal with at one time or another is aphids. They 
are tiny little soft bodied insects. They range in color from yellow and green to brown. They, they look, look, different species look different. They, um, they have little mouth parts where they pierce the plant and they suck sap and they remove pretty large quantities of sap when they're in large numbers, which reduces the growth and the vigor of the plant. So some symptoms you might see, I mean, you'll absolutely probably see them gathered on the plant will be one of your first indications. You might see leaf curling, and if you look inside the curl, you might see actual aphids in there. A lot of times with aphids, you also get ants because they excrete a sweet honeydew-like substance and the ants will feed on that. So if you see a lot of ants, you might check a little harder for the aphids. Now, aphids are one of those insects that have a ton of natural enemies. They're, they're very weak and they're very um, easy for a population of, let's say, ladybugs to just come in and totally wipe out. So this is one if you have aphids where I wouldn't even think twice before spraying anything because um, there's a good chance the natural enemies can help you take care of this problem. Sometimes the aphids are just in such a high number though Maybe you might need to act um, before they completely destroy your plants. So you might consider insecticidal soaps. That's a more uh, natural option. But even with the more natural options, definitely want to um, read the labels on those products. Another really good option for aphids is just to simply wash them off with a jet of high pressure water. Like I said, they're weak, they're soft bodied, they will not come back from that. That will uh, get them off your plants for sure. So you can just simply rinse them off. If you have a really bad infestation and it's beyond rinsing off, here's a list of chemicals that you would want to look for. Now I'm giving you here active ingredients. These aren't the, the trade names for these products. So you would want to look on the label and the active ingredient and, and look for one of these products. Um, we will be sending the slides out in a follow-up email so you will have this. I'm also sending you a resource list or you can click on a link and go to a full sheet on aphids or whatever it is that you're interested in and find these um, different chemicals and these different options as well. So you don't need to um, worry too much about jotting them all down right now. Now this one probably has got to be the number one call that we've been getting on the Master Gardener Helpline. Flea beetles this year, down in Pueblo at least, they've been pretty bad. So this is something that we usually are worrying about in our vegetable gardens. Um, tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, cabbage, broccoli, beans, radishes, beets, and lettuce are the big ones. So I mean, they're, they're kind of general. They'll eat uh, almost anything in the garden. Um, you'll know you have flea beetles because they're little tiny black insects that will jump when you disturb them or if you shake the plant or something, they jump at you. So they're kind of disturbing to a lot of people. And not only are they disturbing when they jump at you, but look at the damage that they do to the leaves of these plants. It's, they just totally decimate them. They eat holes in the leaves. Obviously, that's going to reduce growth, and that can absolutely kill the plant if the damage gets bad enough. So this is usually worse on younger plants. Um, so if you, have health, if you try to use healthy transplants and do everything you can to encourage them to grow rapidly once you get them into the ground, that's helpful. Um, in really bad cases, you might need to use floating row covers, uh, build kind of a little um, structure and then cover it with a row cover so that they can't get to your plants. And then uh, last option would be these few different chemicals here that would work. Um, seven is a very common uh, uh, spray that you might be able to use in your vegetable garden. Spinosad, bifenthrin, or permethrin. Those are the ingredients you'd want to look for in a product for flea beetles. Squash bugs. Now these ones freak me out. They look so scary. So they feed like it is in the name on squash, pumpkin, gourd, and melon, things in that kind of cucurbit family. The vines will wilt, the leaves will turn black, and the plants can absolutely be killed. The young squash bugs are usually kind of green or red, and the older ones look like this photo on the right, which looked a lot better on my computer. It's a little blurry here, <laughs> but um, kind of gray, gray, whitish um, color. And they just, they look creepy to me, like I said. 
So one of the biggest things is um, fall cleanup. It's, you know, if you have a squash bug infestation, you got to get those plants out of there. You cannot let them sit there over winter or the, the bugs will overwinter and you'll have the problem again. Um, so get rid of them. You don't want to have mulch around plants where you're having a squash bug problem because they can overwinter in the mulch. So you'll want to pull the mulch back of those plants um, if you did have a squash bug problem. Hand picking adults works because they're big enough. These like we couldn't hand pick flea beetles; they're too small. But the squash bugs are big enough that you can pick them off. Um, so hand picking would work for these ones. And then to get ahead of the problem, if you look on the undersides of the leaves, you might see a, the egg mass, which is the picture on the left here, a little cluster of orange eggs. Crush those or remove the leaf, get rid of the eggs before they hatch, and that can help you to get ahead of the issue. Um, you can use diatomaceous earth or a product with pyrethrin applied around the base of the plant. Now what this is going to do is kind of scratch up the insects and basically cause them to dehydrate because they have scratches on their um, surface. So that is definitely something that can be helpful. Um, if not, you'll want to look for one of these three ingredients in a spray. So esfenvalerate, permethrin, or carbaryl, which again is seven. So you can um, use those products if you have a really bad infestation. Grasshoppers. Oh, and these ones are so hard and so many people have such huge problems with it because they are hungry. So they will eat a lot. So what can we do about grasshoppers? They're, like I said, they are hard. Um, one thing we can do is um, hope for cool, wet weather in the fall and winter. They, are, they lay fewer eggs in kind of the fall and winter, depending on the species, when it's cool and wet. And you know, if it's a really cold winter or a really wet winter, a lot of those eggs don't make it through. So um, that's why we still have like grasshopper ears and not grasshopper ears. A lot of times it's weather related. So the first thing you can do is hope for cool, wet weather. <laughs> um, these guys will eat a variety of plants. They eat uh, vegetables, they eat shrubs, they eat trees. They'll eat just about anything that they can get their little jaws on. Just to kind of show you the appetite of a grasshopper, it's really crazy. So um, seven grasshoppers per square yard. Let's say that's the density of grasshoppers that we have, seven per square yard over a 10 acre field will eat the same ration as a whole cow. That's crazy. So these things are so hungry. They're hopping all over your yard, trying to eat anything they can. They're hopping all over your neighbor's yard. They, they can eat a lot. Luckily, there are a lot of things that eat them. Uh, birds, rodents, certain spiders, big spiders, um, skunks, and then there's some flies and, and actually a worm called the horsehair worm that can parasitize a grasshopper and, and kill them that way. So they do have some enemies. Um, you know, if you see, if you have chickens or something, maybe let them loose and, and see if they can help, help you take care of the problem. Now there are some options um, that you can use. Uh, Carbaryl, again, seven, or malathion um, can be sprays that you can spray. Uh, they also, Carbaryl comes as a bait. So it would be on like a wheat or wheat germ or something like that that you would set out and the grasshoppers would eat that and then consume the, the product that way. Um, Nosema locuste is a, uh, oh shoot, I believe it's a, a protozoan. Don't quote me on that. I'll have to get back to you on exactly what it is. But it's a natural enemy that parasitizes grasshoppers and kind of kills them from the inside. It messes with their growth so they can't grow and they'll eventually just end up dying. Um, now they have baits. There's a couple different brand names. You may have heard Nolo Bait. Um, I believe the other one is Seamuscore. Those are the two that I know of. But just like with the um, Carbaryl bait, you set it out, they eat it. Um, and that's a, actually like a natural product. Now if like a bird were to eat the grasshopper after it ingested the Nolo, um, it's not going to affect the bird. So it's pretty, uh, a pretty environmentally friendly option to use. But I will say, it's really hard to control grasshoppers because they're so mobile. Um, so even if you're doing something, your neighbor might not be, or the person across town might not be, and 
on bad grasshopper ears, even if you're doing all of this in your garden, they're still really, really hard to control. So just keep that in mind. Another one that's been a real pain for us in Colorado, um, especially in certain parts of Pueblo, although I feel like they move all around town now. I'm not sure if Pueblo West you guys have one yet, but is the Japanese beetle. Um, if you live over by either of the big parks, City Park or Mineral Palace Park, then you're probably pretty familiar with the Japanese beetles. And the worst part about them is that not only does the adult beetle damage plants, which we'll talk about, but the larva is a big pest of turf grass in the form of a white grub. Their larva is one of those white grubs that you find in your lawn that kind of give you those yellow patches and feed on your lawn. So they kind of give us a double dose. The larvas are, are damaging and the adults are damaging. I'm gonna focus on the adults. I didn't really wanna to get too much into turf or trees because those could totally be their own classing. So I'm kind of focusing on um, uh, ornamentals and vegetables that aren't turf or trees. So I'm going to focus on the adult beetle for this, for the purposes of this. If you want to read more though in the resource list, you can go to the fact sheet on Japanese beetle um, and click on it and read more about the larva as well. So the main thing that you will see the Japanese beetle on are going to be your Virginia creeper, your roses, raspberries, grapes, green beans, and then there are several trees that the Japanese beetles might be found on. Um, now traps are not recommended. There are traps available where they're, um, they're kind of a green um, shape and they have a yellow top and you put a little pheromone pack in there and it sends out a pheromone to the, um, all the beetles and they come and they get trapped. So um, they do trap the beetles, but that pheromone, it's going to bring them in in higher numbers than and it's not going to be worth it because you're just bringing them and attracting them to your yard. That's, it's been found that they actually make the problem worse. They're really handy for monitoring for the presence of Japanese beetles or to kind of monitor how many are around, but not really useful in a home garden kind of situation. The Japanese beetle is one where hand picking is really, really beneficial. First of all, you're getting those individuals off and, you know, getting rid of them, but Japanese beetles, when they feed on plants, release um, a, a pheromone of some type to other Japanese beetles that calls them in and says, hey, over here is where we're feeding now. Um, they're called gregarious feeders because they gather together and they feed because they're sending out those signals. So if you get the Japanese beetles off, those signals suddenly aren't being sent and that really helps you get ahead of the problem. Now you can absolutely just hand pick them off throw them in a bucket of soapy water. But if you go out like early in the morning when it's still kind of cool and they're feeding a lot and just shake the plant over a bucket of soapy water, that's even easier. So that's definitely a good option. The really tricky thing about the Japanese beetle is that it's feeding on plants at the time that pollinators are also visiting the same plants. So we really are limited and we have to be very, very careful when using a chemical product to control Japanese beetle because the crossover with bees is so huge and so many bees have been harmed by people trying to control Japanese beetles, you know, that you just really, really have to be careful. So here's a whole list of products, carbaryl, bifenthrin, and the whole list here, imatoclopred, these are effective in controlling Japanese beetle, but they absolutely cannot be used on a plant when it's in flower. They are super toxic to honeybees and, and all bees and um, will absolutely kill them. So um, that's actually uh, a regulated thing. It says on the label of those products not to use it on a plant that's flowering and being visited by pollinators. And um, technically not following the label of a product is against the law. You're entering into a agreement that you're following the label when you use a product. So definitely don't use those on the flowering plants, uh, save the bees. Now this next list, pyrethrin, pyrethrin azadiractin, and acetamiprid can be used at um, like certain times of the day or certain times of the year. It would indicate that on the label. They're a little less toxic to the bees, but still can be harmful. So there's some precautions you still need to take but those ones are a little bit safer to use. 
And then we have a couple of options that are um, even more safe, that are found to be not, not super toxic to the bees. So Bacillus thuringiensis variety gallery, um, you would probably see it as like a beetle stop or something. I think that the, some of the trade names are called. This is a, a biological control because this is a bacteria that will infect the Japanese beetle and, um, and kill it that way. So that wouldn't hurt the bees. And then this other um, ingredient here that I'll let you read and try to pronounce, um, one of the examples of a trade name would be a celepin, is found to be more safe. But again, check the label. False singe bugs. So this is not a super common pest, but we have gotten a few calls about them. And I have seen that they have been showing up um, in some places around uh, Colorado, Southern Colorado this year, so I thought I'd throw it in. So this is going to typically attack mustard family plants, so radish, canola, mustard greens, also could be on potato, kochia, lettuce, pigweed, quinoa, and even sometimes turf grass. So um, they kind of have a little bit of a range and they do attack some weeds, which you're thinking that's a good thing, right? That's a good reason for weed control because if you have pigweed in your yard, and the false cinch bugs are attracted to the pigweed, well, they might also find the way into your garden and eat your lettuce. So that's a good reason to know what weeds you have and get those out of there. They do tend to aggregate. So you can see in the picture on the right, there's kind of a whole chunk of them, a whole cluster of them. And when they aggregate, they can cause some plant damage. Usually um, they show up when it's kind of more dry. So good irrigation can usually knock them down pretty good. Um, sometimes you might need to use a chemical only if you're an agricultural producer and they're in that kind of large number in your field. But actually chemical control in a home garden is not usually recommended. The only really thing is, um, you know, mechanically removing them or increasing your irrigation a little bit. Spotted cucumber beetle. Uh, as the name implies, it's a problem on cucumbers. Also, though, cantaloupe beans and corn. And when they're in a high number, if we have a lot of spotted cucumber beetles, they will tend to move onto your ornamentals. So they'll move into your flower bed um, if there's a lot of them and they're real hungry. So floating row cutters are definitely an option. <clears throat> Problem with that is your cucumbers need to be pollinated in order to get cucumbers. So you might have to kind of find the balance there with covering them and uncovering them to let pollinators in. Mulch is good. It can help prevent them from laying eggs in the bare soil. So if you've got spotted cucumber beetles, you will want to mulch. Um, if, you know, if you need to use a chemical, here's the list. Acetamiprid, carbaryl, brinpropithin, and escandalorates, and also cryolites. Again, you'll get these slides, so don't worry. Um, <clears throat> clean up is critical. Fall cleanup, if, if you're having really any problem in your garden, clean it up real good and rake up everything. Don't let any plant matter sit. Um, for a lot of the diseases in particular, you don't want to compost it and then put that back into your garden because you're risking um, that it didn't get hot enough to destroy <clears throat> any eggs or diseases and you're just going to end up with that problem again. Harlequin bugs. I think that these bugs have the coolest looking eggs. That's a picture of their eggs on the left there. But they're a pain. They will feed on your cabbage, your broccoli, horseradish, cauliflower, collard greens, mustard, turnip, radish, cress, things in that kind of like cabbage broccoli family. They lay eggs underneath the leaves. So those really cool looking eggs will be found on the underside of the leaves and they will actually lay eggs three times a year. So they can have three generations. Um, which makes them kind of a problem all growing season long. Hands pick the adults, you see the eggs, get rid of the leaf or just destroy the eggs. Clean up the debris, like I mentioned before, just make sure that nothing's falling that could have eggs or something on it. And then um, if you need to use a chemical, pyrethroids such as permethrin would be the ingredient that you want to look for. And again, just make sure that that's being labeled for edibles if you're using it in a vegetable garden. All right, tomato hornworm. These big, creepy looking green caterpillars, mostly on tomatoes, 
Um, also peppers and potatoes. There's also a very closely related caterpillar called the tobacco hornworm that you might also see on the tomatoes, peppers, and potatoes. Um, uh, it looks pretty similar. So they do lay large pearl colored eggs on the upper sides of the leaves, not the lower sides like some of our other beetles. They will defoliate the heck out of your plants and they might even chew the fruit. So they are destroying both. They're huge. I mean, compared to some of these insects we've been talking about, they're big. And so you can hand pick them. The problem is seeing them because they blend in with the stem as you can see in the picture. So you might like, you know, be looking at the stem and notice it's moving and you're like, wow, well, that's, a, that's a caterpillar. So, um, but you can hand pick near dusk and dawn or your best chances to catch them. Bacillus thuringiensis, just like we had for the Japanese beetle, another variety will be um, fatal to the, to the hornworm. So you can look for that and that's a biological control. Otherwise you can look for carbaryl, permethrin, or spinosin to control this guy. Oh, and the picture on the right is actually the moth that the tomato hornworm becomes. So I thought that was kind of interesting and we'd show that. Okay, here's one that's gonna attack your flowers, the tobacco or geranium budworm. This thing is does some serious damage to geraniums and petunias. In certain parts of the country, they can't grow geraniums or petunias because of this budworm and the crazy amount of damage it does. Luckily, it's not quite that bad around our parts. So the thing you're going to see is, first of all, a lack of flowering is the first thing you're going to see. When you do get flowers, they might be kind of distorted or have holes in them. That's the sign that you have this budworm. And they're pretty small, so you might not even see them until you look close. Um, you can kind of see the picture here of them. They can be red, green, or brown. They usually have stripes on them. So, um, you know, if you see a caterpillar in your geraniums or your petunias, you can bet that it's this guy. And that's the moth on the right that it'll turn into, just a little tiny moth. So if you have damaged flowers, pick them off. There might be um, a larva still in there. If it's a really bad infestation, and especially if you want to um, overwinter your plants, if you're bringing them inside or something, you're going to basically have to remove the soil and repot that plant to, to get a really good hold on it. Um, if you want to start, if you really love geraniums, ivy geraniums are tend to be more resistant. So look for that um, as just planting a resistant variety. All right, spider mites. This is a pretty common one around here because it's hot and dry where we live. They're small. They're smaller than the head of a pin. So you might only see webbing or you might only see kind of the um, the speckling that they cause. You might not ever actually see them unless you look real, real hard. So like I said, they speckle kind of in this picture on the right, a broadleaf plant, and they also will attack your conifer trees. And with that, you'll more just see a fading of color and probably some wetting on the tree. Um, these ones are pretty weak too. Ladybugs, pirate bugs, and other predatory mites will take care of the spider mites for you if you have them around. If you have a spider mite problem, you probably have a plant that's getting a little bit too hot and too dry. So adequate watering can usually have, help you take care of the problem as well. Just like with aphids, hose the plants off with a jet of water. That should help. Horticultural oils can help. That's kind of a more natural product, but you still need to definitely follow the label. And the only chemical that's really effective is bifenthrin. So that's what you'll want to look for on the label if you need to use chemicals. All right, and our last pest that I'm going to talk about is the spinach leaf mite. This is an interesting one. You may have seen your spinach looking like this picture on the left with kind of, we call them blotch mines. They almost look like the tissue has just become clear and there's these like brown kind of dead clear spots on the spinach, um, mostly spinach, also beets and certain leaves like lamb's quarter. So that's a good reason to pull the lamb's quarter around your garden if you have a spinach uh, growing. It's most common in gardens where you um, kind of like overwinter spinach and beets if you have the ability to do that. That's the most common place. Um, Destroying the eggs is helpful. You'll see in the picture on the right, the egg masses are kind of distinct. They're these like kind of little skinny eggs laid all in a row. If you see that, get those off there 
any leaves that are showing damage, pick them off and destroy them, throw them away. The larva still might be in those little blotches, so you don't want to eat them um, and, and just get rid of them so they can't lay more eggs and keep reproducing. So I am going to take a little break and check out the chat really quick. Let's see if I have anything. It looks like we're all good, okay. Well, I'm gonna keep powering on then with this presentation. Grab a cup, quick drink of water. And we'll get into the diseases. The diseases are harder, if you ask me, because you know, you don't see a fungus really you don't see a bacteria or whatever it is you see the symptoms and sometimes it's hard to tell exactly what's going on when you see these symptoms sometimes the best we could do is it's viral you know and and maybe we have to go, go for control that way some of them are really obvious though and hopefully we'll get uh cover some of the ones that you might be dealing with there we go okay so let's start with powdery mildew. This is a super common one. I am currently battling powdery mildew in my own garden, actually. Um, so the leaves will appear kind of white and dusty, like a talcum powder has been dusted on them. And you're, it's gonna be common mid to late summer. That's when it's gonna start showing. And you're gonna be seeing it possibly on ash trees, definitely on your lilacs, your grapes, your roses, possibly on your turf grass. Um, fruit trees, Virginia creeper, and then the biggest one are vegetables, particularly the cucurbits. So your zucchini, your cucumber, your uh, melons might be susceptible to powdery mildew. Those are the ones that you need to check out. Right now I'm battling it on my zucchini. Um, powdery mildew is going to tend to show up when plants are overcrowded and there's not enough air circulation and or maybe when there's overhead watering going on. So, you know, you're not watering right at the root of the plants. You are actually splashing water on the leaves. That's sometimes going to be when we see powdery mildew showing up. Um, I think I have both these problems. My garden is way overcrowded and uh, my sprinklers hit. So, I mean, I was just bound to get powdery mildew. <laughs> so, I'll see what I can do about that next year. But uh, if, if you, have an infestation and pruning to increase air circulation isn't enough. You can try sulfur dust, you can try neem oil, triforine, or potassium bicarbonate. Now potassium bicarbonate is basically baking soda. So you can also use baking soda mixed with a horticultural oil as kind of your liquid and spray the leaves with that. So you're probably going to need to do it uh, weekly for several weeks is if you uh, want to get ahead of it. Um, if you always have a problem, you can try to use it preventatively. Just make sure the label of the, the product that you get calls for that. I'm on week four of using neem oil in my garden and it actually seems to kind of be subsiding. So I'm very happy to see that. Um, and don't compost your infected leaves. This is one that it needs to get real hot to kill the powdery mildew and your compost pile might not reach that temperature, so um, just throw them away. Early blight. This is real common on tomatoes. You'll see brown to black spots on particularly like the older lower leaves. Now, the older lower leaves will tend to yellow as the season goes on because they're getting shaded out by the top of the plant. But if you're seeing these kind of lesions and it's working its way up the plant, you might look at early blight. It can move to the stems and fruits. So if you can catch it while it's just on the leaves, that's best. Remove any leaves that are infected um, immediately. Don't let them sit in the soil. That can make the problem worse. And next year, you're not going to want to plant tomatoes in the same spot. You're going to want to give it a year or two to kind of go away before you plant tomatoes there again. So, you know, if you only have limited garden space, consider planting your tomatoes in a pot next year. They actually do great in a pot. Um, increasing air circulation and avoiding overhead watering. I feel like that might be on every single one of these disease slides. That's a good thing to do if you're dealing with any kind of disease in the garden. Air circulation, try not to splash water, just apply it straight to the roots. If you have drip irrigation, that's ideal. But if not, just get that watering can down to the surface of the plant. 
Um, sulfur dust can also be tried on, on early life. A cucumber mosaic virus. This is our first virus that we're talking about. This um, kind of will cause the veins, which you can kind of tell on this picture on the left here, to turn clear. It takes the color out of them. And then you'll see some yellowing and mottling on the other parts of the leaves. You can get the started fruit. We're looking for this on our cucurbits, tomatoes, spinach, celery, beans, peppers, beets, potatoes. Also, there's many ornamentals that are subject to this. So even though it's called cucumber mosaic virus, it will attack a lot of different other Not sure what happened there, everybody. Sorry about that. I dropped out of the meeting, but I think we're all good and we're all back. Are we all back, Christina? Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, Sherry, sure. you're back and you sound good. Awesome, just so you can share. Okay, sounds good. So back to the cucumber mosaic virus. Um, okay, so the bad part about it is it attacks a lot of different plants and it's, uh, there's not a really a lot of control. There's not a lot you can do. Basically, if you think it's best just to pull the plant and get it out of there and destroy it right away. Blossom and rot. This we call this on tomatoes. I'm sorry, I just see a chat. Are you guys not seeing my screen right now? Yep, okay. Can you see the blossom and rot slide? Yes. Okay. You're good. Awesome. Okay, blossom and rot. So this is typically something we, we think about on tomatoes, but it can affect peppers, squash, eggplant, and watermelon. So um, something to think about. So we're going to see these leathery kind of black brown lesions on the blossom end of the fruit. So kind of on the bottom. Now the reason that it happens is a calcium deficiency. So right away you probably think, oh, okay, well I'll just get some calcium fertilizer and everything's fine. That's actually not really going to solve the problem in most cases. Like, there is a chance that it's a, a, just a straight up calcium deficiency and that will help. But what's more likely is that it is something going on that's causing the plant to not be able to take up the calcium that is there. It's usually there in all right numbers if you've got a good garden soil. But something's happening that's not allowing that plant to use that calcium. So when we have um, extreme temperature fluctuations, or just extreme cold or hot for a prolonged amount of time, and coupled with moisture fluctuations, so you're not watering super consistently, that's when we start to see it. So the best thing you can do is stabilize your moisture levels. Get on a watering schedule, stick with it, be really consistent with your watering, and mulch so that you kind of stabilize the moisture and the temperature in the soil. Also, you're going to want to avoid excessive nitrogen fertilizer if you're seeing uh, blossom and rot. Um, so maybe if you're fertilizing a couple times a week or something, not just knock that down to once a week and see if that helps. All right, hollyhock rust. Uh, if you grow hollyhocks, this is rarely fatal, but it's kind of ugly, you know, you see on the leaves there. Common in the spring and the fall, kind of on those tail ends of the seasons where the tail end and the front end when the weather is a little cooler. Um, you'll see pustules on the bottom of the leaves and orange or yellow spots on the top of the leaves. You can pick off and destroy those infected, infected leaves immediately. Um, after the hollyhocks bloom, you might want to pull that whole plant and get rid of it um, so it doesn't spread. Avoid overcrowding and overhead watering again. I told you it was on all of them. <laughs> um, and then if you do want to treat them, so this doesn't really affect the blooms. This is one of those ones where if your blooms look good, maybe just leave it. But if you, if you really hate the way these leaves look, you can try sulfur, microbutanil, or chlorothanol. That will do. Again, you'll get the slides. Slime mold. This is just a really, I think it's a fun one. 
And I've gotten a few calls about it this year because, I don't know, down here in Pueblo, we've had a couple really, really humid uh, times, which isn't common. So I think that's why we've been getting a couple instances of slime mold. Now, this is gross, but a lot of times people will say, I think an animal might be vomiting in my yard because it kind of looks like it just appears suddenly. Um, and, you know, it's uh, just this bony patch. And you might see it on your turf and you might see it on wood mulch in your garden, especially if it's freshly ground or if it's been kind of wet and humid. So um, the, co the color does vary. It can be purple, white, brown, yellow. Um, it doesn't really cause any plant disease, but if it sits on top of your turf or something, it can cause some yellowing because it blocks out sunlight. Um, you can rake your mulch or rake your turf and reduce watering if possible. Wash it off with water. That should get rid of it. From what I've read, it's not harmful to animals or anything. It's kind of just this weird occurrence that we sometimes see. So I thought I'd bring it up in case you might see that in your yard. All right, for our strawberry growers, um, this is called red steel root rot. This is something that's a problem on strawberries. Springtime, usually, it's a fungal disease. It's common in heavy, wet soils. We have some heavy soils around here in Pueblo, so we might see this. Um, the plants will be stunted, and they might, they lose their shininess. They'll be kind of matte, and the younger leaves may appear to be kind of metallic looking. The center part of the root will be a rusty red brown color. So if you were to cut open the very center part of the root, you would see how that uh, picture there looks. There are varieties that are resistant. If you're able to increase the drainage of your soil by mixing in some compost or something, that will help. Um, there's also a product called aluminum trees or tris, not sure. It's sold as a spray and it's also sold as a pre-plant dip. So you can actually dip the root of the plant in it before you plant it and that could help out too. Rose mosaic virus. Um, this, this happens, it affects pretty much only grafted roses. If you have roses that are grown on their own rootstock, probably not gonna be a problem. Um, the leaves will be kind of mottled with yellow. Most of the time, the flowers are unaffected. So this is another one where, I don't know, I think it looks kind of cool and the flowers aren't affected, so maybe just leave it. Up. If you hate it, there are some options. For one, buy a stock, root stock that's guaranteed virus free. Ask about it at the nursery you're buying it from. If you have infected plants, take them out. Um, and like I said, a lot of people choose to ignore this one because the effect on the flowering is so limited. So you definitely don't need to do anything about it if you don't want to. So that's all I had. I would like to leave this slide up for a second so you can write down my email address. If you want to send me some pictures or want to ask me some questions about what's going on in your um, yard, then this is where you can reach me at. Kathy S at PuebloCounty.us. And you know what? I'm going to put that in the chat. I'm going to stop the screen share now so we can answer some questions. Let me pull the chat up and I will enter my email address. We, we got a question about aphids in the chat from Carolyn Forster. All right, let's see. Oh, shoot. I lost the chat history when I dropped out. Can you okay. see that? It says, um, Aphids decimated my lupines. What should I do to the soil to be sure the eggs don't overwinter? Okay, um, you know, you might want to try to this winter, if you have it mulched, um, pull back the mulch. That way they're kind of more exposed. Um, I would definitely try to avoid any pesticides so that early spring when the ladybugs are kind of laying their eggs and their larvae are hatching that they can eat the young aphids. Um, and uh, I don't think there's really anything to put in the soil to treat, um, to treat it uh, for the eggs, but um, hopefully just monitoring it, getting ahead of them early, maybe if it's going to be a problem next year, catch it early and use one of those products right away. Um, are there other questions, Christina, that came before I dropped out?
unmute. Uh, no, I didn't see any. Okay. I know everyone is, I, I see a couple and then I will send out the slides to you. You'll get a follow-up email that'll have uh, the slides and the handout with the resources and um, possibly a little survey. If we have a couple minutes, we would like to get feedback on that. I have the poll today, but um, okay. So got questions uh, popping up now. Awesome. Okay. Um, slugs are... Yeah, they're not usually a huge problem around here because we're so dry, but you might see them. Um, they can harm your vegetable plants. Let me just pull up what, I, what we're suggesting to do about slugs. Now, reducing humidity is good for the slug. So if you have a very overcrowded garden and you can kind of selectively prune some of your plants to get a little bit more airflow, that will definitely help. Um, you know, I mean, kind of mulch, sometimes they will hide in the mulch. So that's another reason you might want to pull back mulch, um, clean up any kind of leaves or anything. Um, using soaker hoses or drip irrigation will usually help because it's, uh, it decreases humidity. <clears throat> there are some traps. There are some different um, insecticides that you can use. And let me put the link in the chat where you can see the list of those. Western leaf skeletonizers on grapes this year. They had some last year, but they weren't bad. Two to three years, they had a terrible infestation. That is not one that I'm familiar with. I have not gotten any calls. Let's see. Western leaf skeletonizers. Let me see if I can send you a um, fact sheet about that, Miss Moore. It's, tip, it's a big one in Western Colorado. I did know that where they have all the vineyards and stuff. Um, I don't see it. Okay, right here. I'm gonna post this link in the chat for you. It'll have some suggestions on that. White flies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if you have a greenhouse. The person who asked about white flies, they're typically seen in greenhouses a lot. And yes, we do have suggestions for them. Actually, our fact sheet is called Greenhouse White Flies, so. <laughs> um, let's see, there are, let me see if there, there are some biological controls that you can get. And there are definitely a list of insecticides here that you can use. Um, horticultural oils can be used, um, insecticidal soaps can be used, and it looks like there is a list of other ingredients that you should look for. So for the white flies, there you go, it's in the chat. What do I do with the many bugs on the bottom of my rhubarb leaves? Um, it would be awesome, Sherry, if you could email me a picture of the bugs. Um, if it's all the leaves, that's kind of a problem. Um, you might try rinsing them off. You might try just picking the leaves that they're on, but if that's going to leave you with no leaves, you can't do that. Um, if you shoot me a photo of those bugs over, I can give you a more specific answer for that. Um, let's see. Okay, uh, there, for the person who asked about the skeletonizers, um, Bacillus thuringiensis, it looks like somebody um, has used, but you need to be proactive with it. So anticipate that problem. Cockroaches like my mulch. Oh, that's unfortunate, Dawn. But are they a foe to my plants? Not typically. No, they don't typically cause too much huge problems with the plants, but it is, uh, they're unfortunate to have around, I know. And there's definitely a lot of products you can use. If you'd like, I can pop the um, link to the fact sheet in so you can see those. All right, popping the link to the cockroach fact sheet into the chat if you'd like to see the good products that you could use or what you can do. I think I've got everyone answered. Um, I'll, you know, we'll wait a couple couple seconds here, see if anybody else wants to chime in on the chat before we end the class. 
Okay, and actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do that poll real quick. So you guys should see a poll coming up on your screen. And if you wouldn't mind answering these two simple questions, I would be so appreciative for your feedback. And in the meantime, I'm here to answer questions. So and thank you to Christina and Carolyn for the help. I apologize for dropping off. That's why I came into the office because my internet at home is no good, but apparently it didn't help. Yes, roly poly. So they they only really eat them when they're young, as you mentioned, but that can be. So let me tell you what we suggest for roly poly. Called a sow bug also. So roly poly, roly poly. There we go. Looking like we're going to use um, carbaryl, so seven is going to be pretty much your best option for the roly polies that are hurting your young plants. And I popped that link in the chat for you to check that out. Um, brown spots on the flowers, leaves. Uh, what kind of flower would be my first question? Um, and then, you know, it'd be great to see some photos of those, Sherry, um, if you could, if you were able to send any over. That kind of, that kind of depends. There could be quite a bit of things depending on the flower and kind of what it looks like and, and things like that. Let's see. About 28. Some people don't see the poll, but some people are voting in it, so I'm not quite sure why. It's not popping up for everybody. Um, Dawn is asking, uh, you know, she's introduced ladybugs, praying mantises, beneficial nematodes into her yard. Are there other similar bugs that you'd want in your garden? Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of assassin bugs. Um, there's a lot of, of natural enemies that are, that eat insects. Um, and mostly, you know, you can buy some of them commercially, but mostly just creating an environment that's kind of free from chemicals and just an inviting environment. If the pests are there, their enemies will find them. So as long as you're keeping it kind of um, uh, bug friendly in a way, even though you're trying to get rid of bugs, it's, it could help with the bad bugs. Uh, and Sherry says on her zinnias. Okay, let me think if there's anything specific on zinnias. Just checking the poll here. Um, that's okay, Susan, that that poll's not popping up for you. That's, that's not a big deal. All right. Looks like we got just about everybody on the poll. Um, I am going to go ahead and end the poll. Um, and thank you so much for taking the poll. Glad to see a lot of people learn something. Um, about the leaf miners, yeah. Um, well, I, we were talking about the spinach leaf miner and uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. We can try to find the eggs and get rid of them and then destroy the leaves. The problem with the leaf miner is it kind of is in the middle of two layers of tissue. So nothing that you would put on it would really get to the actual critter. So I'm um, kind of just destroying the infected leaves. If you have lamb's quarter, a weed growing around your garden, get rid of that because that will tend to bring them in in higher numbers. And on the resource list I'll be sending out, I do have the fact sheet linked for the leaf miner, for all the leaf miners that you might see in Colorado. We talked about the spinach leaf miner in particular today. Any other questions? 
Susan or Sherry, I am looking and seeing if I can maybe come up with some suggestions for your zinnias really quick. There's a lot of different um, leaf spot, like fungal leaf spot diseases. Um, which one it is, it's hard to say um, without seeing it, even if I did. I find fun, no, because they look kind of similar. But um, you can, um, if possible, thin them out, try to increase air circulation. That usually helps. Um, you can look for a fungicide at your local garden center that's labeled for zinnias, and that that would be fine to use too. You'll want to apply those as soon as you see them. Um, there's also a bacterial leaf spot that um, there is a site for. So mainly just uh, increasing circulation. 